First of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. Um, so this work is uh, some joint work with uh, Roger Kolbeck. And in it, we, we look at uh, sequential violations of uh, the CHSH network. Okay, so for those of you interested, the reference is here, or you can also find the work on the archive. So we know that uh, non-local correlations are a useful resource. Uh, for example, if we have some Bell test and in it we observe some Bell inequality violation, then we know, for example, that there has to be some randomness produced by the devices. And this observation leads, uh, leads us to build so-called device independent protocols, for example, for randomness generation or key distribution. Now, the typical way in which we imagine we're generating these correlations uh, in a Bell test is that uh, we share some entangled state between the devices and in response to the inputs, the devices perform some measurements and we record those outcomes, uh, the measurement outcomes as the outputs of the devices. And typically we just assume that the state is either destroyed during the measurements or we just throw it away and the next time we want to generate some more uh, correlations, we send in another fresh entangled state. However, we know that there are measurements that don't destroy the entanglement between uh, the two halves uh, of the state. And then so you can imagine that, okay, we still have some entanglement if we perform those measurements. Uh, maybe that entanglement is still useful for uh, violating again uh, a bell inequality or generating more non-local correlations. So then the question is, okay, then can we use this remaining entanglement in some useful way, for example, to generate extra non-local correlations? And maybe this would make uh, sort of implementations of device independent protocols uh, more efficient in terms of the number of entangled states that we have to distribute, for example. Okay, so in this work, we investigate a particular um, sequential non-locality generation scenario uh, that was introduced in this paper here. So in this scenario, we have some initial entangled state is shared between Alice uh, and Bob One. And when Bob one has performed this Bell test, he'll pass on the post measurement state to Bob two, who will uh, then perform his Bell test and pass on the post measurement state and so on until Bob N has performed his Bell test. And the figure of merit here is gonna be uh, the CHSH violation between Alice and Bob K for each Bob. So in particular, all of the inputs and outputs of uh, the devices in this scenario are binary. And we're also going to assume that the input distribution is chosen uh, uniformly. Okay, and so we also make a, a restriction on the bobs and we, we assume that the only information that is passed from one bob to the next is um, the post measurement state. So in particular, bobs later on in the, in, in the sequence uh, don't know the inputs and outputs of the, the previous bobs. So this means that, for example, we can compute the shared state between Alice and Bob N uh, via the shared state between Alice and Bob N minus one averaged over uh, Bob N minus one's uh, POVM elements. Okay, yes. And so the, the main question that we want to, to address in this work is that suppose we're given uh, that Alice and Bob one share some entangled, initial entangled quantum state then what's the maximum number of bobs that can achieve an expected CHSH violation with Alice simultaneously? So this, um, this question has been uh, analyzed previously. So uh, for the maximally entangled state for two qubits. So for example, zero, zero plus one, one. And uh, in this uh, initial work that introduced this scenario, uh, what the authors were able to show is that if you uh, if you allow the bobs to very heavily bias their input distribution, then there's no bound on the number of bobs that can achieve a, a CHSH violation with Alice. Um, however, they also uh, mentioned that they had some numerical evidence that suggested that uh, without this very heavy biasing of the input distribution, then at most two bobs could violate CHSH with Alice. Okay, and then about uh, a year later, there was a um, a work that gave a proof of, of this bound of two bobs, but only under a restricted class of uh, qubit measurements. Um, and so what we show here is that actually if we, um, the, the general statement is actually false, if we allow the bobs to 
to use gen uh, uh, general qubit measurements. So if we remove this restriction on the class of measurements, then again, we recover the, that there's no bound on the number of bulbs that can violate. So in particular, if you give us some natural number n, we can give you an explicit uh, measurement strategy such that the first n bulbs in the sequence can violate. Uh, and moreover, we also extend this strategy to a larger class of uh, two qubit states. So it's not just the maximally entangled state that has this property. And in particular, this larger class of two qubit states uh, includes uh, all entangled uh, pure two qubit states. Okay, so let me present the strategy. So uh, the, out the outcomes of our devices are binary. So we just need a two outcome P of M. So we can denote it via a single, uh, single operator. And the measurements are going to be in the ZX plane of the block sphere. Uh, so we have some angle phi here. Um, and we also have some uh, factor here, gamma, which we'll refer to as the sharpness of, of this measurement. So the sharpness you can think about as a sort of trade-off between how much the, the measurement will disturb the state and how informative that measurement is. So for example, if uh, gamma is zero, then the measurement is identity over two, identity over two. Uh, it doesn't disturb the state at all, uh, but it also doesn't tell us anything uh, about the state. So it's completely non-informative. Uh, however, on the other end of the spectrum, if gamma is one, then the measurement is projective. Uh, it's sort of the most informative measurement we can have, uh, but it also will destroy the entanglement in our two qubit state. Okay, uh, and so the, the, the actual strategy uh, that we came up with uh, is, is very similar to the optimal strategy uh, you would use in order to get uh, the zero sum correlation, so two root two violation. So Alice, is, uh, Alice has a single parameter theta, so she can choose her measurements uh, and they're gonna be symmetric about the sigma z axis of the block sphere. Um, and uh, each of the bobs uh, are going to measure. So each of the bobs on input zero will measure a projective, uh, a sharp sigma z measurement. And on input one, they'll measure sigma x, uh, but a, a, an unsharp version of sigma x. Okay, and they can all choose the, their sharpness parameters freely between some, some value between zero and one. Okay, um, yes, and so, if you, if you plug in this, uh, this measurement strategy for the maximum entangled two qubit state, then uh, you can inductively compute the expected CHSH violation between Alice and Bob K, and you'll, you'll end up with this formula here. Okay, and then uh, the main result of the work basically says that for any natural number n, there always exists a choice of theta for Alice and a choice of uh, n sharpness parameters for the first n bobs in the sequence, such that they all expect to violate CHSH with Alice uh, simultaneously. Okay, so uh, maybe a sketch quickly how you would show this. So um, if we have an expected CHSH violation um, between Alice and Bob K, then just by rearranging this expression over here, we know that we must have the kth sharpness parameter uh, of the bobs is larger than this quantity here. Okay, and we, we can force this to happen by just picking some epsilon greater than zero and setting uh, Bob K's sharpness parameter to be one plus epsilon multiplied by this, uh, this threshold here. Okay, and now the only thing that can go wrong uh, by defining this sequence of sharpness parameters is that the, the one of the sharpness parameters might grow too large and, uh, and become larger than one and become an invalid sharpness parameter. And when that happens, this square root is not well defined. Uh, and so we deal with this scenario just by setting the, the rest of the sequence to infinity, which says, okay, no more bobs can violate uh, the CHSH with those. And then the rest of the proof is basically uh, showing that we can always choose this uh, measurement angle of Alice, theta small enough such that the first n sharpness parameters are sandwiched between zero and one. Okay, and this basically is the basically boils down to uh, considering this gamma k as some function of theta and showing that the limit as theta goes to zero uh, of gamma k is zero. Okay, once you've done that, uh, you basically have uh, this construction basically gives you a, a measurement strategy for the bulbs. 
Okay, and so we also, as I mentioned earlier, we also uh, could extend this result um, to general two qubit states. Uh, and so uh, I, I won't mention, I won't present the, the measurement strategy here, but um, uh, basically we will give a, we give a measurement strategy to the paper and we, um, we get a expected CHSH violation for a generic two qubit state. Uh, is this expression here, okay? And it depends, it's it's almost the same as for the maximum integral state now, except we have these two uh, factors, S1 and S2, which are the singular values of this uh, of this correlation matrix here. So this correlation matrix uh, was shown, the singular values of this correlation matrix was shown by uh, a paper by Hardesky, Hardesky, and Hardesky. Um, it was shown that um, that were related to the maximum CHSH violation of a, of a two qubit state. And in that paper, they, um, the, the proof that they're related to the maximum CHSH violation is constructive, and it also gives you an optimal measurement strategy for that two qubit state. And so basically, we just took that optimal measurement strategy for the two qubit state and sort of made it into a sequential strategy in the same way that we took for the maximum entangled state the, the Cirrusson correlation strategy, and we made that into a sequential strategy. So doing the same thing, we end up with this expression here. And now um, the proof that uh, I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, this all goes through exactly when um, the largest singular value is equal to one. Okay, and so when the largest singular value is equal to one, we can go through the proof again. Uh, and uh, in that case, we have no bound on the number of bobs that can actually achieve an expected CHCH violation with ours. Okay, and this, uh, this uh, condition of S1 equal to one is actually true for all, for example, for all pure entangled two qubit states. Okay, so one thing that comes out of the proof is that if we want more bobs to violate uh, the CHSH, inequality with Alice, then we have to choose theta smaller and smaller, okay? And so we could ask the question, okay, well, how small do we have to choose theta if we want n bobs to violet the CHSH with Alice? And uh, we don't know exactly uh, the exact scaling of theta, but um, we have some numerical evidence and some analytical evidence that suggests that theta would have to decrease towards zero double exponentially fast in it. Okay, so here I just plot the number of CHSH violations versus theta log scale. And uh, for some uh, values of this epsilon parameter. And we see that uh, even when the, this theta is plotted log scale, we have this curved behavior, which is telling us that it has to decrease faster than exponentially. And we also um, looked at some first order approximations of these, this uh, gamma k sequence as a function of theta, and we found that the coefficient of theta uh, blows up double exponentially fast. So it's very likely that we need to choose uh, this theta n parameter um, to be double exponentially small in n if we want n bobs to violate. Okay, uh, and kind of in turn, this is uh, pretty terrible for the actual CHSH violations that the, the bobs will achieve. So uh, you can actually upper bounds the, the expected CHSH violation between Alice and Bob N as two plus uh, some, some term that uh, decreases exponentially faster than N multiplied by theta. And if theta is decreasing double exponentially faster than N, then this thing gets very small very quickly. Okay, so maybe this is not the best thing uh, uh, in, in practice. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, that's, that's uh, let me kind of wrap things up, I guess. Uh, so, um, so what we showed, we showed that we can actually have uh, this un these unbounded violations for this scenario introduced in here, even when the, the biasing of the, the inputs of the bobs is, uh, is, is, uh, is not present. And we also extended this strategy to uh, a larger class of, um, of two qubit states that includes all uh, two qubit pure entangled states. Okay. Um, uh, and I think maybe one of the, the, the important take home messages of this work is uh, that it's, uh, it's very important to consider the, uh, when you're analyzing these sequential scenarios, 
the most general form of measurements possible. So, uh, for example, if you if you look through the literature, uh, there have been uh, several works that have um, investigated this scenario where we have a single Alice and a sequence of bobs, and they've looked, for example, at uh, steering uh, inequalities or entanglement witnessing, or they've analyzed other bell inequalities, or even multipartite settings uh, in the same thing. And what all of these works uh, have in common is that they all find very strong limitations on the number of bobs that can um, achieve whatever task they're analyzing. Okay, but uh, another thing they, they have in common actually is they all uh, sort of restrict their analysis to um, this, this class of measurements that I noted was, was in this uh, proof of this two bobs result. Uh, and so in light of this work where we showed that if we, if we remove this restriction on the class of measurements, then this bound of two bobs disappears, uh, it's maybe worth rethinking uh, some of these results uh, from, a, from the perspective of having general uh, qubit measurements. Uh, so, for example, we already know uh, that non-locality implies uh, the presence of entanglement. And so, you know, for example, we could lift uh, the, the, the bound found in this paper. Uh, and secondly, I think uh, a consequence of, of this work here showed that uh, if, we, if we consider this uh, restricted class of measurements, uh, then not only could uh, with the bound of two bobs hold for the CHSH inequality, but it would actually hold for any Bell experiment uh, that had two outcomes. So even by giving, if we, if we uh, restricted ourselves to this class of measurements, even by giving the bobs uh, as many inputs as we'd like, they'd still only be able to achieve two bobs violating simultaneously with ours. Okay, something maybe a bit... Um, uh, a bit more of an open question is whether we can actually translate these um, sequential schemes into some actual practical advantage, maybe for um, uh, maybe for making these, as I mentioned in the motivation, these device uh, implementations of device independent protocols actually more um, uh, more efficient. Uh, and as well, I think it would be nice uh, if we could find uh, some way in order to analyze the scenario where not only do we have a sequence of bobs, uh, we would also have a sequence of Alice's. Uh, I think this, this scenario uh, would probably lend itself better to actually um, maybe some more cryptographic applications, but uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Okay, so with that, uh, uh, thank you for listening and I'll give you some, uh, leave you with the references. Okay, thank you very much for presenting these nice results. Um, we have already, I think, three questions. Uh, so Levi is asking, does the ordering, does the time ordering in measurements of Alice and Bob matter in showing of locality um, sharing? Because you seem to use unsharp measurements on one side. Um, I, I mean, uh, we could just assume that Alice and all of the bobs would be space like separated, uh, and then the ordering wouldn't matter. No? Uh, okay, then uh, Julio de Vicente is asking what if S1 is not one? Is it, pos is it impossible to have violations for an unmodded number of bobs? Uh, yes, this is an interesting question. Uh, we don't know, uh, and uh, yeah, this is a this is an open question. Uh, basically, via the strategy that we present, no, uh, and the reason is that um, basically, if S S one is not one here, then the the corresponding uh, limit as theta goes towards zero would not, not tend towards zero. Uh, and this doesn't. Uh, this allows you not to prove it in this case. But uh, this is again. This proof is done for a very particular strategy, and uh, whether or not uh, there would be a different strategy out there which could actually work, we we don't know. Uh, so this would be something to think about definitely. Okay. Um, so I have also one question. So you considered only qubits, right? Yes. Okay. 
does it make to make us make actually sense to go to Qtrix or I mean because as as more information you can transport between the bots, the easier it gets. Somehow. Yes, uh, this would be something to think about. Yes, uh, we we didn't think about this. Um, but I know, for example, uh, the steering paper uh, looked at the scenario and they got, so they, 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 they were in this scenario where they found these strong limitations on the number of bobs, but they also found uh, uh, the limitations on the number of bobs in terms of the dimension of the system. So they showed that as you increase the dimensions, you could have more bobs uh, violating the steering inequalities, for example. But whether you could make the, the CHSH violations more efficient uh, by increasing the dimension, I mean, you definitely could because you could share, for example, uh, two maximally entangled states instead of one. Uh, and then, well, yeah, it's, it seems likely, okay, it's not, it's not completely obvious actually because Alice only has one measurement to perform. Um, but yes, okay, yeah, I, I imagine it, it would it would uh, be more efficient if we had higher dimensional systems, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much.